Chapter 9. How Pollution is Killing Fish Too. The face of nature may be compared to a yielding surface with 10,000 sharp wedges packed close together and driven inwards by incessant blows, sometimes one wedge being struck and then another with greater force. Charles Darwin on the Origin of Species. Page 118. So they've tried to limit the effects of overfishing over the years with regulations, and to some extent, some of these measures have proven successful. But why are the fish populations still shrinking? Clearly something is going wrong. The destruction continues. Page 119. While there is still much overfishing in the world, many of the traditional fishing grounds within 200 mile limits are tightly regulated. Most of the fishing fleets of Europe and North America have been following all the regulations that were handed to them. And despite a few successes here and there, the fish populations are not rebuilding satisfactorily. Fishermen have made tremendous sacrifices without seeing their stocks become healthy once more. Part of the problem is that we too easily forget that all of human activity, not only fishing, affects marine life. For centuries, pollution, human waste, garbage, the poisons, the poisonous byproducts of industry were dumped into the sea. Large ports such as Boston, New York, and San Francisco, as well as the big ports of Europe, Asia, Africa, most of the world are polluted. And this pollution has washed into the sea. So have the hazardous chemicals used in industrial agriculture to kill weeds and insects. When it rains, these poisons wash into the rivers and continue onto the sea. Some of the most polluted parts of the ocean are near the mouths of great rivers. There are areas of the sea called dead zones, where large amounts of phytoplankton die from pollution, and as they rot, they use up all the oxygen in the water, and fish can't live in water without oxygen. Page 120. Many of the industrial pollutants in the ocean do not break down in the water, so they move through the water unchanged, looking for the fatty tissues of plants and animals in which to deposit their components. Over the past century, tremendous quantities of petroleum have spilled into the oceans. Some have been the result of thoughtless dumping by industry, but a great deal of it has been by accident. Much of this has been caused by accidents to oil tankers, huge ships used to transport hundreds of thousands of gallons of petroleum. It would be safer for the oceans if oil was transported in smaller ships, but oil companies argue that this would make oil far more expensive. The public first became aware of the problem in 1967, when one of the so-called super tankers, Torrey Canyon, accidentally dumped 100,000 tons of oil off the British coast, causing tremendous damage for many years along the coasts of Britain and France. Page 121. In 1989, a tanker called the Exxon Valdez broke up in Prince William Sound, Alaska, which had been a pristine sub-Arctic paradise for a wide range of fish, shellfish, mammals, and birds. The accident seriously damaged the entire life system of the Arctic. Although the United States passed legislation requiring all newly built tankers to have a double hull after the Exxon Valdez disaster in hopes of avoiding a repeat of that kind of catastrophe, the damage had already been done. When the oil reaches the shoreline, some parts of the oil evaporate, leaving behind the heaviest components and turning the oil into tar. Oil sinks into marshes and beaches and remains there for years. But even in the areas that are relatively easy to clean up, the damage from oil spills has been recorded for decades after the spill. Fish and shellfish developed abnormal characteristics, including, in some cases, an inability to reproduce. Page 122. In 1969, the barge, Florida, broke up off of Cape Cod, Massachusetts, and dumped 200,000 gallons of diesel fuel into a famous resort area. The disaster received a lot of press attention because the same year an offshore oil rig accident covered another famous beach in Santa Barbara, California, with black, heavy crude, which is really thick oil. In Cape Cod, thousands of fish, shellfish, and birds died, but after some months of work, the area was cleaned up, and was, as was Santa Barbara. The wildlife came back, the tourists returned, Cape Cod recovered, and the incident was largely forgotten. But 40 years later, scientists at the nearby Woods Hole Oceanographic Institution went into a Cape Cod salt marsh and found that the mud just below the surface still smelled of oil. Fiddler crabs were no longer digging deep holes, instead stopping when they hit the oil layer and then digging sideways. They appeared to be drunk from the oil fumes. Drilling oil under the sea also poses tremendous risks. Page 123. Such accidents do not happen often, but when they do, with disastrous results, it becomes clear that oil companies either cannot or do not have adequate safety practices to prevent such accidents. 
The world was once again reminded of this in 2010, a time when the idea of increasing such oil drilling in the sea was gaining popularity. Suddenly, on April 20th, an oil rig operating in the Gulf of Mexico exploded, killing 11 platform workers and unleashing the largest oil spill in history. Until the leak was plugged up on July 15th, the well was leaking about 2 million gallons of oil every day. The exact amount, possibly more or less, is not known, but it was the equivalent of a major oil tanker disaster every day for three months. The leak left an oil slick in the Gulf of Mexico that was estimated to be 2,500 square miles. Those storms will widen it. There is also much more oil left under the surface and not visible. Unlike the Santa Barbara accident, this is not thick, heavy oil, but a lighter product known as sweet crude, which is not only more toxic, but very difficult to gather and remove, and it is certain that some of this oil will remain in the sea for thousands of years. Page 124. The Gulf of Mexico is an important breeding ground for fish, birds, and marine mammals, and the long-range effects of this accident on the life of these animals, the ecology of the ocean, and if Darwin has understood, the entire natural order of the planet is beyond the ability of science to measure. The Gulf of Mexico disaster was a failure of both private industry and government. The responsible oil company, British Petroleum, had failed to follow the safest possible procedures in an attempt to reduce operating expenses. But the government agencies that were expected to regulate offshore drilling and make sure it was safe did not object to British Petroleum's approach. BP had a record of negligence. In October 2007, BP was fined $20 million for the Prudhoe Bay oil spill. The oil company had ignored warnings by workers of a corroded pipeline in its drilling operation on the north slope of Alaska, an area with a fragile environment rich in wildlife. On March 2, 2006, a quarter-inch hole was discovered in a pipeline in Prudhoe Bay. More than 200,000 gallons of oil leaked. BP had paid a $12 million federal criminal fine, $4 million in criminal restitution to the state, and $4 million for Arctic research. Top of page 125. BP's local subsidiary, BP Exploration, Alaska, Incorporated, was placed on probation for three years. BP also drills in the North Sea, historic but badly over-harvested fishing grounds. Fishermen, recognizing the potential disaster, vehemently opposed offshore oil drilling and successfully blocked a plan to drill off of New England. Unless the world reduces its use of oil and turns to renewable energy sources such as solar and wind power, there are certain to be more disasters like this in the oceans. Page 126. Experts who analyze the oil industry say that most of the oil in the world that can be taken easily is running out and oil companies will increasingly extract oil from riskier and more difficult places. This means unless it's banned, not only more offshore drilling, but drilling in fragile environments like the Arctic and places where accidents can easily occur. One of the biggest oil discoveries of recent years is a vast pool under a mile of ocean off of Brazil. Known as pre-salt oil, this enormous pool of oil must be drilled not only in deep ocean waters, but under a mile of unstable shifting seabed made of salt, sand, and rock. This oil field is many times more likely to lead to an accident than was the Gulf of Mexico oil field. It's not just big oil spills that have catastrophic results on the ocean ecosystems. Some of the deadliest pollutants such as mercury and polychlorinated biethanols, known as PCBs, are extremely difficult to ever, to ever clean up. PCBs are used in the, manuf in the manufacture of electrical equipment, paints, motor oils, plastics, floor finish, and numerous other household items. In the United States, until such practices were banned in 1979, these pollutants entered the land and consequently the sea from waste produced during manufacturing. Since the PCBs do not break down, most of it is still in the environment. Page 127. More has been added from illegal dumping, leakage from landfills, and consumer products with PCB content being thrown away by the individuals using them. PCBs travel long distances in soil, air, and water, and have been found all over the world in places far from where they even entered the environment. The smallest animals eat these poisons, and then the larger animals that eat the smaller animals get the poisons. But they don't just eat one animal at a time. They eat massive quantities of these animals. Page 128. These larger animals now have more poisons in their systems than the little ones did, so that by the time you get high up in the food chain, the concentration of poison has become much stronger in an individual animal. 
The largest fish will have eaten large quantities of the contaminated smaller fish, which makes the larger fish dangerous to eat for the animal at the top of the food chain, which is us. Several poisonous metals, including mercury, chromium, and lead, have made their way into the oceans and their food chain in much the same way as PCBs have. Page 129. These metals are what is known in chemistry as elements. As of 2009, there were 118 elements. Most of the poisonous metal elements like copper, mercury, and lead have been known and used for thousands of years, though it was not until more recent times that it was understood that people were being poisoned by the use of the elements in pipes, dishes, and cooking pots. Once introduced to an environment, it is very difficult to get rid of elements because they can't be broken down any further. Water, for instance, can be broken down into two elements, hydrogen and oxygen, that together make up HTO, and table salt is made of sodium and chloride. But hydrogen, oxygen, sodium, and chloride are all elements, and can't be broken down into anything else. In some cases, children with low school performance have been tested and found to have high levels of mercury from eating contaminated fish. Women who are pregnant are warned to avoid eating large quantities of bigger fish, such as tuna, because of the possibility of ingesting too much mercury, which is potentially quite harmful to a baby in its mother's womb. This is especially sad because otherwise, the natural content of such fish is considered quite healthy, full of proteins that used to be quite beneficial to humans. But these poisons also seem to have a profound effect on fish populations, and although there has not been enough research on this, one of the side effects appears to be a reduced ability to reproduce. Top of page 130. While oil byproducts, PCBs, and mercury have received the most attention, there are large quantities of other similar pollutants. Without anyone taking much notice, chromium has become another major, po major pollutant in the seas. Chromium, like mercury, is a metal, an element known in chemistry by the symbol CR. Unlike most of the poisonous metal elements, this one has not been known for thousands of years, but was only discovered in 1797. It takes a very shiny polish and extremely hard and resists corrosion. Bronze weapons found in burial pits in China, which archaeologists have dated from the late 3rd century BC, show no signs of corrosion because the bronze tips of crossbow bolts and swords found at the site were coated with chromium. It is this quality that makes it extremely valuable to a wide range of industries. It is added to steel to make it rust resistant. It gives color and opaqueness to paints. Because of its ability to take a shine, it is used as a protective coating on car parts, plumbing fixtures, and furniture parts. It's used in many kinds of kitchenwares, including knives, and is an important element in textile dyes, jet engines, treating wood to protect it from termites, high-performance audio tape gasoline, and curing leather. Fourth line, page 131. The paint used to make school buses yellow is made with chromium, and it tints glass green. In short, it is almost everywhere. Every, it is in almost everything we manufacture on this planet. And unfortunately, it has ended up in the sea, the last receptacle of industrial pollution. Even those who study sea pollution have been surprised at how much chromium pollution is present nowadays. Although small amounts of chromium are needed by human bodies to process sugar, and there is even a disease called chromium deficiency, excessive amounts of chromium are poisonous to both humans and fish. It is known to cause cancer and damage to kidneys, liver, and blood cells. But there was little public awareness of the issue until 2000 when the film Aaron Brockovich was released. Based on a true incident in California, it is the story of an entire community that was poisoned by industrial chromium seeping into the groundwater. Research has shown chromium-based products cause chromosome damage to hamsters. Marine biologists have also found it has the potential to alter DNA of fish. DNA contains the genetic in instructions used in the development and functioning of all living organisms. Page 132. Alterations in DNA are key to evolution. If they cause successful changes to a species in the environment, the species will continue. It might take millions of years to see the subtle changes caused by alterations in DNA if a species is successful. But it wouldn't take that long if the alterations to the DNA were not successful. There is strong evidence that DNA damage in fish is reducing their ability to reproduce at all, which could cause fish species to disappear, even without our overfishing of them.